Hello, my name is Jesse Burbank, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive many great opportunities. If you are a member and would like to, if you are a student rather, and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. We'd like to encourage each of you to get special benefits and support the Dole Institute by becoming a friend of the Dole Institute. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Hearing assistance is available, and we have a loop section at each program designated by a sign. If you have any questions about the loop, or if at any time during the program you experience difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers, and they can assist. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we'll have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you're able and ask just one brief question. <laughs> and now, please welcome Dean Ann Brill of the William Allen White School of Journalism. Thank you, Jesse. Good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and tonight's Journalism and Politics Lecture, co-sponsored by the KU William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications. As Jesse said, I'm Dean Ann Brill, Dean of the School, and it is always a pleasure to partner with the Dole Institute of Politics. It is my honor to introduce tonight's program. Tonight's interview will be conducted by Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. I'd now like to introduce you briefly to this evening's speaker, a distinguished journalist with nearly 36 years of experience covering a wide range of stories. Josh Mankiewicz is a Dateline NBC correspondent based in Los Angeles. He has reported on events, including Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, the 1996 and 2000 presidential campaigns, national, state, and local politics, and the Iran hostage crisis. And a lot of murders. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't rehearse that, Anne. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. Prior to joining Dateline, he also worked for ABC News, Fox Broadcasting Company, KCAL-TV KCAL in Los Angeles, WCBS in New York, and WJLA-TV in Washington, D.C. He's also a very good sport, as evidenced by the interview he gave last year to Lucy Lawless better known as Xena, the warrior princess. As he told Ms. Lawless, what he is doing is indeed his fantasy job. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Josh Mankiewicz. Josh, let's start by having everybody get to know you a little bit uh, better. Tell us about your upbringing, your education, and what drove you to finally decide to do journalism as a career? Okay, first of all, um, let me just say, first of all, how many of you watch Dateline regularly? <laughs> okay, okay. All right, tonight's, tonight's lecture is gonna be entitled, Matrimony, Luminol, and You. <laughs> <laughs> Open your books to, yeah. Um, uh, you know, the other thing I should mention right off the top is that uh, when I was at ABC News back in the 80s, uh, they spent probably a hundred grand on voice lessons uh, trying to get me to uh, speak like Jesse. Uh, <laughs> and as you may have noticed, it didn't work. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in California. My dad was an uh, entertainment attorney back then, but he'd been a, a newspaper man in an earlier life. Uh, and um, I was going to public school in Los Angeles when my dad decided that... Uh, that uh, representing uh, Steve McQueen and uh, Jay Silverheels, uh, who played Tonto on The Lone Ranger, uh, was not the way he wanted to spend the rest of his life, although he was gonna probably make a lot of money doing that. And he uh, signed up to go to the Peace Corps. This was in like 1961. And so we went to Peru for a couple of years, which was certainly eye-opening when you're seven years old. Uh, I came back from there, and we were we were in D.C. for a while, and I went to I went to public school there, and then later a private school there, and um, and my dad sort of uh, went uh, stayed in public service. He was the 
he worked for Robert Kennedy. He was Robert Kennedy's press secretary, and then uh, for the campaign until uh, until the, the, the assassination. He ran the McGovern campaign in '72. Um, he was uh, he was big pals with Bob Dole um, at a time in Washington where people uh, from the left and right had some common ground. Um, uh, some that doesn't happen very often anymore, unfortunately. And uh, he wrote a newspaper column. I mean, he went back and forth sort of between politics and journalism in a way that I think you probably can't now. Uh, he was president of National Public Radio at one point. And then sort of at a time, at about the age I am now, at a time when a lot of people are sort of starting to think about retirement, he had a 30-year career in public relations, and he passed away last, uh, last October. But from my dad, I got this uh, exposure to national politics and to journalism. And so from about age eight or 10, uh, this job or some permutation of it was pretty much the only thing I wanted to do. And so I'm pretty lucky that I've been doing it, not for 36 years, as Ann said, I wish that were true, but for 40. This, uh, <laughs> I started in 1975. Uh, so this is my 40th year in the, in the news business. It's my 20th year uh, at Dateline. Um, so, um, I, yeah, and I, and I always tell the truth to Lucy Lawless, because, you know, because it's Lucy Lawless. Um, uh, and uh, um, th this is the only thing I ever wanted to do, so I'm pretty lucky. So I always think about how lucky I am when I'm, you know, when they're yanking me out of bed on Sunday and saying, you need to go to Cleveland right now. <laughs> so that's, uh, and I, I, uh, I, I went to, uh, I went to Haverford College in Philadelphia, where a um, little tiny liberal arts college about the size of this room, uh, and um, um, there were 600 students when I got there. Uh, maybe more than that when I left, but not a lot more. And uh, I, there were no journalism courses there to take or communications or anything like that. So I got a liberal arts education, but by then I was already pretty focused on this. I was starting to work at ABC in the summers, and I started there as a part-time employee in the summer of 75. And uh, it's been one long ride since then. I was a, I, I covered the Hill for a while when I was at ABC, uh, off camera. Then I was a, became a local TV reporter in Washington. Then uh, in New York, in LA, I was a correspondent at ABC for four years. I never got on the air very much, so I left there and went back to local news, uh, which a lot of people thought was crazy, but it ended up being really good news. And then I went to Dateline 20 years ago, uh, back when we did all kinds of stories. Uh, and we did four or five of them in an hour, which actually was the format I, I enjoyed the most of all the things we did at Dateline, because you'd be doing you know, investigative stuff, you'd be doing political stuff, you might do a profile of some celebrity. It was, all, it was all fun magazine stuff. And then about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, um, we started doing these crime hours, and the audience ate them up. And as many of you know, and uh, uh, and so here we are. Yeah, so I'm at work on like three or four of those right now. Is so. that the principal focus of your work? It is, at the moment it is. Now, in uh, in January of every year, actually February, uh, the NFL season ends, and Sunday Night Football goes away on NBC, and so Dateline on Sunday comes back. And we just keep our Friday night slot, but on Sundays we, we, get, we get an extra play on Sundays after football season. and. I think that's going to be. Um, uh, we're sort of ex we're sort of discussing right now, sort of what that's going to be, but it's not going to be more crime hours. It's going to be maybe something a little meatier and a little bit more serious. And so we're all sort of at the moment trying to figure out sort of exactly whether what that's going to be, whether it's going to be several stories within the hour or just one single story the way we do now. So that's that's pretty much where Dateline is yeah. at the moment. Lots of journalists talk about getting a big break that really kind of prepared their, propelled their career forward. Did, did you have an episode like that? Carl like Bernstein. Uh, no one remembers this. Carl Bernstein was hired um, uh, by Rune Arledge, who was then the president of ABC News and ABC Sports, to be the Washington bureau chief of ABC News. This was in 1980. And Carl did not know anything about television, but he was a great reporter, obviously, and I think Rune thought that that would, uh, that, that would sort of translate. And it probably did, except that Carl was miscast as a manager. He was not, uh, certainly not cut out for that, and he had a, he had a, a glorious failure uh, as uh, Washington bureau chief, but it was, uh, 
uh, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and he did a lot of interesting things. And one day he said to me, I was then uh, sort of a, they called it an off-air reporter, but it was really sort of like, a, like an associate producer. And I worked on Capitol Hill. And so I was, um, you know, I knew all the congressmen and senators and their staffs. And I knew, you know, sort of which, you know, like if you want to do a story about fire ants, you know, who the fire ant guy was, you know. You know, if you wanted to do a story about rural electrification, who that guy was. And, um, and so it was a lot of sort of inside baseball, behind the scenes stuff, which I just adored. And Carl, it was Carl's idea that I'd be on television, which I wasn't at all sure I wanted to do. But he, uh, he said, no, you're going to do it. This is a great idea. You, you're going to, when, when he set me, set up me up with an audition. And then he called the guy. Um, who was this Texas banker named Joe Albritton, who owned the Washington, D.C. affiliate of ABC, uh, who had no connection with the network at all, except they were running his programs. Um, uh, I mean, he was running their programs. And, and Carl said to him, I, I really want you to take this guy as a reporter, uh, even though he has no on-air experience at all. And these were the days when you did not start in big cities like Washington, D.C. And Albritton, I think a little bit, uh, impressed with Carl's Pulitzer Prize and his, his fame at the time, if you might remember this was 1980, uh, Carl, he agreed to take me on. And, uh, and I went there, and I did about a year and a half there, and I learned how to be a TV reporter there. And it was weird, because you know, I'd grown up in D.C., so I was all of a sudden working like alongside all the people I'd seen in high school. You know, I was in high school thinking to myself, gee, I'd like to do that someday. And now here I was, I was at the next desk. And that was all Carl. And whenever I see Carl, which is not very often, like every 10 years or something, I bump into him somewhere, Carl always says to whoever else is there, he points to me, he says, this is the only thing I did in TV that worked. <laughs> <laughs> talk, Josh, a little bit about your craft. When you're approaching a story, kind of talk a little bit about the research you do, uh, different members of your team, kind of what your role is. Just kind of go into a little bit of depth about that. Okay, I mean, television is... You know, all TV news is a very collaborative effort, and the more, uh, the more, the longer the amount of time that you're going to fill, sort of the more collaboration there is. So there's like, you know, it, we, even it, for the for the stories that are on your local news that are a minute and a half, that's at least a couple of people working together. And the longer it gets, and the better it gets, the more people there are. So I mean, we have we have people who do initial research and spade work, and go out and you know, you know, come come here and talk to, you know, talk to the prosecutor and talk to the victim's family. First, they're on the phone with those people. They read all the newspaper articles. We have people who, who we send out from New York and they just sit through the trial, in many cases photographing it themselves with cameras like these. Um, you know, and it's our job, their job to sort of make, make contact with everybody in the story. Meanwhile, I'm getting read in on it and I'm, you know, they, they've told me about it so I'm reading stuff online about it and they're sending me briefings on it. And then finally, like, we figure out when we're going to shoot this, and it has to be, you know, a time when all those people can pretty much do it at not the same time, but within a couple of days, because we don't want to come back here five or six times uh, if, like, this is where it's happening. So, so, um, uh, so we'll set up that shoot, and then the producer and I work out all the questions that we're going to ask each of these people, and sort of who based on the all extensive pre-interviews that have been done over the phone, uh, and in some cases in person, although not on camera, um, you know, we figure out sort of who's going to be the, 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 the character that's going to carry us through. And we'll do an outline as to sort of, you know, you know, part one, she's missing, nobody knows what happened to her. Part two, we find her, she's dead, and suspicion immediately points at her husband. Uh, part three, husband gets arrested. His family says he shouldn't do it. Part four, uh, uh, part four, uh, cracks start appearing in the prosecution's case. Uh, part five, there's a uh, suddenly there's another suspect, uh, and it turns out the DNA doesn't match. And part six, it wasn't the husband; it was the next door neighbor. Uh, <laughs> stay tuned for your late local news. Uh, so, uh, and we'll sort of lay all that out bit by bit. Um, I mean, my favorite story, but everybody's favorite story at Dateline, is one in which the obvious suspect is not the guilty party. And the toughest stories, of course, are the ones in which, which there's just not a lot of suspense, because the way we do it, it's all about sort of the storytelling and suspense. And although we're covering crime, which is not sort of the way I, I 
what I envision doing at this point in my career. Um, you know, most people like start on the police beat, and then if they're lucky, they end up in doing Congress. I've done it exactly the opposite way around. <laughs> um, but uh, but there are certain elements of journalism that sort of hold true no matter what you're covering. Um, you know, you need to be absolutely certain and solid on all the details in your story. Um, uh, after we've you know, after we've written the draft of the story, the producer and I, and sometimes I write them myself, and sometimes we write them together. Um, you know, we always sort of ask ourselves, okay, if I'm if I'm the guy that's getting accused here, or if I'm the person that we're 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 suggesting may have gotten away with murder, how how am I going to feel when this thing airs? Am I going to feel like you know these people interviewed me and then they didn't use it and they kind of screwed me, or am I going to feel like well I got my say? Um, you have to make sure that you challenge all your characters, even the sympathetic ones, even the people who you have no reason to disbelieve. Um, everybody sort of is, should get challenged equally, and everybody gets their say. And you know that doesn't mean that you can't lay out the story. In as, I mean, we don't begin stories by saying, here's an interesting story about a guy who was a, a, accused of killing his wife, but it turned out he didn't do it and he was acquitted. Well, <laughs> you won't be around 58 minutes from now. Uh, <laughs> So we say, here's a, here's a story about a guy. He and his wife, uh, he was married. They had this storybook marriage. Then one day, she turned up dead. Then it turned out they didn't have such a great marriage. He was having an affair. And so immediately, suspicion fell on him. And here's the reasons why it looked like he was guilty. And here's what he said. And here's what his friend said. And here's what the prosecutor said about what his friend said about him. They think he's the, they're just lying for him because he's their pal. And then it turns out, there's somebody else who was angry at the wife over something that the husband didn't have anything to do with. So, and by the end of that, you you uh, you get to the same place, but you have taken the audience around some some corners and down some alleys. And uh, you know, based on all those hands I saw up earlier, some of you like that. <laughs> you know, although I sometimes I you know, on Twitter I hear people say, you know, I just spent two hours on that. I knew it was him. You know. <laughs> uh, so we do try to we do try to sort of I mean we were ultimately we are faithful to the truth and what happened in the story. I mean we're not saying, you know, we're not saying person A did it if in fact they didn't do it. But but how we get from from the crime to person A being convicted is in fact sort of part of the fun of of writing it and uh, and doing it. And we do all kinds of stuff. And and as as the audience sort of gets more hip to the things that we do we have to sort of adjust our game a little bit. Like, you know, people know that if the guy's being photographed like this, you know, he's probably wearing orange, you know? <laughs> so, and we don't want to give that away. So one thing you can do, you can photograph everybody like this, right? Then you can't tell. Or, as we've done in a couple of cases, one of the great things about these privately run prisons is they're willing to sort of like, you know, bend the rules sometimes. Like, you go to Leavenworth and say, hey, okay if we bring in, like, a blue blazer and put it on this guy we're interviewing? And like, no, it's not. <laughs> but, but, you know, when it's the, you know, prison and, you know, storm door company, then they're, <laughs> they're, they're a little more, hey, sure, why not? Let's, you know, the guy's like, they're going to get away, you know? So sometimes, like, they let us dress the guy. Then once, if you can, you know, just put, you know, if you could just put a sweatshirt on him or something, anything that sort of from, you know, here up changes the way he looks, then we can put, you know, candles behind him and pictures of his family and stuff. <laughs> and it looks like, you know, it looks like he's in his living room. And only then, you know, 42 minutes in, we pull back, you realize he's shackled. So, <laughs> so when we do that, that's always a lot of fun. One time we took the, uh, we took the oil painting, we took a painting off the wall of my hotel room the morning of the interview. <laughs> Right? And we brought it into a prison with us. And, you know, the, the corrections officers, they're looking through our gear really carefully because they want to make sure we're like, not bringing in a gun or something, right? But, like, an oil painting, a landscape, they were like, ah, that's fine, you know? So, so we come in, we get this big painting, which with a, with a camera stand and some ropes, we hung behind the guy, right? And we couldn't bring any clothing in, but I took my jacket off and we put it on him. And he wasn't wearing orange, like his, his prison uniform was like gray or something. So it actually kind of worked with the jacket. Uh, so, so then it looked like he was like, you know, being interviewed like in his den. Uh, and, and so, and then we got through like almost two hours of that before we had to reveal that he was actually already in the slammer. Um, 
and you know, we do that because, you know, we don't want you to think in the first five minutes, he did it, he's guilty, he's already in custody. So, that's just some of the stuff we do. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've covered such a variety of uh, different subjects and material in your career. You've covered, you talk about crime, you've talked about uh, politics, you've covered pop culture, you've done so many different. If you had to pick one out, to talk one story to talk about a little bit tonight that you still find especially fascinating, uh, what would it be? Well, I mean, you know, the story I was sort of afraid, there were two things that I was afraid that I was going to be like mostly, that I was afraid it was going to be like, you know, in my obit. One was I did like 12 or 15 hours on Michael Jackson, uh, which was this interesting story in the sense that like half the audience was sick of it, and the other half could not get enough. And so we kept doing it. I mean, through all his trials and tribulations and his weird behavior and uh, the charges against him, which were pretty serious and backed up by some significant amount of evidence. Uh, and all the other things that sort of, you know, that were sort of part of that, 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 you know, giant whirlpool of publicity around that story. And, you know, it, it was, it, 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 when you're dealing with something like that, which is like a big Hollywood scandal, you know, it brings you into contact with, you know, uh, people that you're never going to meet any other way. And these are, uh, you know, some of the uh, some of the bottom feeders of journalism and law and and PR. Uh, and you know, the rule that we adopted when we were covering Jackson, we were we we, uh, we did very well. We were on that story. We were never wrong. A lot of other news outlets were at different times. We were never wrong, and we broke a lot of stuff on that. And one of the rules we had was that the people who want to talk, who come to you volunteering to tell you their story, they're almost never the people you want to talk to. <laughs> they're almost always the people who have some kind of agenda, or they're lying, or they have some reason for wanting to like, you know, slither their way in front of your camera. <laughs> That's actually pretty good advice for all kinds of other journalism, too. You know, the people who are dying to be on TV, those are probably not the people you should be talking to. <laughs> so that was certainly one lesson we learned when we were covering Jackson. I mean, I've covered some, like, particularly, like, astonishingly noxious crimes. Um, there's two things, you know, I, 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 I sort of with a story. It's not as much a story that's, that's, that's struck me as it is some, some truths about men and women and marriage that... You know, I mean, Dennis Murphy is one of the Dateline correspondents, has a saying that I think he actually put in a story, which is when we're doing a story, it's never the murder, it's the marriage. That's the thing to look at. There is a colossal amount of violence in this country being committed against women by men, and a lot of it occurs uh, domestically. On the flip side of that, there are an astonishing number of women, uh, and we cover them, uh, and we have covered them, uh, who, to an unbelievable extent, close their eyes to problems in their own relationships and in their own lives and will not see what is right in front of them and will not leave the abuser or the guy that is maybe planning to kill them that they're living with. Because in this country, we are taught, if you have a partner, if you have a spouse, if you're a woman, if you have a guy, you're worth something, and if you don't, then you're not. And any guy is better than no guy. I mean, I, it, we all have seen countless stories of women who could not get away from the person they were with because they didn't have any money, or they didn't have a car, or they had children with that man, and, 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 and were, for one reason or another, unable to leave him. But, I mean, we've done, I mean, I've done a number of stories in which, you know, friends of the victim would, would reach out to her and say, your husband's trying to kill you. That's why you're inexplicably sick. That's why the doctors can't find what's wrong with you. He's poisoning you. He's trying to kill you. And she said, and the case I'm thinking of was this woman who worked in, uh, down in Orange County in, in South Los Angeles. And she said, I'm appalled. I said, no, no, this is not, no, you know, he wouldn't do that. But then the next day, she changed her life insurance so that he was no longer the beneficiary changed it to her sister. But she didn't tell her husband, and she wouldn't leave him. But she couldn't bring herself to walk out of her marriage, even though, clearly, you don't change your life insurance 
That's not something that any of you do, you know, on the spur of the moment. You've got to have a reason to do that, and you've got to feel it very strongly. And she was willing to do that, but she couldn't walk out, and he killed her. He, he fed her nicotine until she died. Uh, and she had, she had no children with him and a six-figure job and a, uh, and, and a number of friends that she could have spent the night with for months on end. But she couldn't bring herself to walk out on that relationship which is sadly something that, 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 uh, that has tragic consequences for a lot of people. That's, that's one of the things that you learn in this business. And the other, uh, a couple of other truths of the criminal justice system that emerge uh, from doing this job. Uh, black men are 6% of the country. Um, I think they're 40% of the homicides. And almost none of that is covered because it all happens, or a great deal of it happens, in big cities, in the bad part of town, and the TV stations just write it off as 20 seconds of VO, it's gang related, and the newspapers maybe run a little thin. And there's this, just this wave of violence going on in inner cities. Uh, a lot of it is black on black crime, and a lot of it is chalked up as, as uh, gang related, when in fact, like, it's almost certainly in many cases, the same things that drive other people to kill. It's jealousy, or it's anger, or it's some perceived slight, or it's someone who, who uh, stole somebody else's husband or wife. Uh, uh, and that's one of the things that doesn't get covered either. So that's just some of the stuff that, oh, and the other thing, I was talking about this earlier today, you know, the big dividing line, um, um, well, let me go back now. I've, I've, I was talking about that, about this, this wave of inner city violence. You know, you talk about the, uh, there's a lot of talk about the Black Lives Matter movement and getting away from the issue for the moment of whether or not there is, uh, whether there's a, a, a problem in the way primarily white police departments police primarily black neighborhoods, and clearly in some cases there is. The emphasis might be to some, it is misplaced in the Black Lives Matter movement because many of those communities don't suffer from too much policing. They suffer from not enough. Uh, lawlessness is sort of its own kind of order. And it's what happens when, when, when people believe in any area, in any community, like if I do something, the police aren't going to come. I won't get caught. Then you have emboldened all kinds of other people to break, go ahead and break the law. There's a great book that I just finished reading about a crime in Los Angeles called Ghetto Side by a woman named Jill Leovy, L-E-O-V-Y. She uh, she's a re was a reporter for the LA Times and covered the south end of Los Angeles, which is where all the murders happen. And and uh, it's a fascinating book about sort of the difference in the in the justice system. But the real separation in the justice system in America is is not as much race as it is money. Uh, if you can afford a private attorney, if you're charged with a serious crime you're gonna get a wholly different shake by the criminal justice system than if you go with the public defender. And the other truth is that if your attorney smells like Axe body spray, you're going to prison. <laughs> Josh, is, uh, is there a story that you wish you could have done or an interview during your career that you wish you'd had the opportunity to do, but you didn't? Well, Mr. Jackson was always afraid of me. He didn't want to sit down with us, uh, I think because he knew sort of what kinds of things we were gonna bring up. Um, um, I always wanted to interview Hugh Hefner um, uh, because of his sort of uh, odd role in American cultural history. I mean, he's a guy who sort of single-handedly took sex from being dirty to being cool. And in the process, I mean, I think aided by Roe versus Wade and by over-the-counter contraceptives, um, he sort of helped create this sexual revolution that in the end ran him over. Um, I mean, Playboy, which was scandalous in 1960, is almost out of business in 2015. Uh, and they're, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting change in the, uh, uh, in sort of the mores of America. And he was there for that whole time. Um, and he leads a kind of a, kind of an unusual life. You know, he gets older and the women don't. Uh, 
Uh, and so I always sort of wanted to sit down with him and sort of talk to him about sort of what he'd seen happening in America, but that hasn't happened so far. Okay. How is uh, technology changing journalism? Um, you know, I mean, the internet has like wrecked nearly every business. I mean, it's done terrible things to television. It's done terrible things to the book business, to radio, to movies, to music. I mean, it's uh, none of those. The, the, the models that existed of all of those businesses are are never going to recover after the, the, sort of the last twenty years of the internet. But you know, one of the I mean, so the, the internet's done done some good things and some bad things for journalism. I mean, it's I mean there are there are lots of journalists now to whom one tweet of somebody saying something that could be a story now, or it could be a source. Um, that was almost unthinkable. Uh, a few years ago, and there's, it, it's led to this colossal decline in standards of what constitutes acceptable journalism. On the other hand, it's also made you know news a product that can be absorbed. You know, I mean, if any of you, uh, if any of you are bored, and I'm guessing about 40% of you probably are right now, uh, you know, you can check out the news on your phone right now. Uh, that was just unthinkable, and so. The result is, you know, um, you know, we have all these outlets now where we can get you information. But on the other hand, since you're reading it, you know, at the bus stop or, or you know, when you're sitting down, you know, in the doctor's office, sort of waiting, or you have a couple of free minutes, that changes also the way that we present the news. That means that that, you know, you know, fifteen thousand word piece on something that you might learn something from, you're probably not going to read that while you're waiting for the doctor. Uh, so the result is more news is consumed, but probably uh, at, a, uh, at a shallower level. Um, in some ways that's good, in some ways it isn't. You know, about, about, about a quarter century ago, yeah, about that, um, journalism, particularly local TV news, which is where I was working at the time, started being taken over by people who saw themselves not as much as journalists as programmers, and people whose job it was to attract and hold an audience, because the numbers reigned supreme. The keeping, keeping your audience through the commercial breaks was what made local TV stations a lot of money. And the result was all sorts of decisions started being made that had almost nothing to do with what was actually going on out there. And the result is that, and you know, and the audience, you know, we never give the audience enough credit. And I say we, I mean everybody in my business, really. I mean, like, you know, like you guys know when we say this is exclusive, this is shocking, this is an amazing, you guys know whether it really is or not. And us saying it doesn't make it true. And, and after a while, if I keep saying something is shocking and exclusive and amazing, and you keep watching, and you keep thinking to yourself, yeah, that wasn't so great. I kind of knew that, or I didn't care about it. You know, maybe I didn't know it, but it didn't matter to me. And it didn't have any relevance to my life. And I sort of thought I knew that anyway. Eventually, you're going to stop watching, because you're not, because I've sort of broken faith with you. Well, you know, um, that's sort of what's happened. Uh, it's one reason why news audiences are down. The other reason is that there's all these different outlets. Um, it's pretty hard to look at cable news if that's all you look at, any of the three channels or all of the three channels, and feel like you're sort of better informed. You know, you're better informed about, about who's taking what position on what issue. But there's a lot of shouting going on out there that doesn't necessarily make anybody better informed. And the original idea of cable news was, you know, we don't have to cram all the events of the day into 27 minutes, or actually 22 minutes when you take out the commercials. You know, we have much more time. And originally, when it was just CNN, and they would do things like, I don't know if you remember this, in the, uh, uh, in the first Gulf War, like they would, uh, they would show the, the entire Pentagon briefing from beginning to end. And some of that stuff was pretty interesting. It was stuff that never would have made the evening news. Now there's no room for anything like that. Um, and the only thing that gets shown at great length is, you know, car chases or something like that. Uh, so, I, you know, I would, I would say that, um, you know, technology's definitely been 
kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, there's certainly some great things. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible now to, to shoot a story in a confined space with no light and do as good a job as if I had a five-person um, professional camera crew. And I actually could be doing it myself, or I could be there with one other person. That's what technology's done. And then we could get it on the air like that day. We could feed it to New York through our phone instead of having to buy incredibly expensive satellite time. So the result is like, you know, all kinds of people can be journalists who couldn't before. In the aggregate, I think that's probably a good thing. When you started in journalism, and when I started in politics, because we both started about the same time, there were three television networks. And today you've got the internet, you've got all the cable networks. What's the future of network television? Uh, you know, everybody talks about network television being broken. I mean, there's still like close to 30 million people watching evening news at night. Between 20 and 30 million, I think. Um, and you know, it goes up on some days, it goes down on others, but uh, um, it's, uh, um, I, I think network news will be around for a while. Um, um, I, think the, uh, I think the way that the, I mean the evening news, it, it's most, by the time, if we give the headlines at 6.30, um, you probably already know that. There's lots of other ways you can get that news during the day. So I think the evening news probably has to change a little bit and, and you know, be less, you know, you know, this just in, here's what happened at the White House. And people are like, no, no, that happened at 10 o'clock in the morning at the White House. I already saw it, and I already saw some reaction to it. So you got to have more than just, you know, here's five-hour-old news. But that said, nobody's in a better position to deliver that than, uh, uh, than the networks. And they need to sort of, I think, adjust the way that they do some of that and do more, more storytelling and more analysis and less sort of reading the day's headlines, because in a lot of cases, people already know that. But I think network news will be around for a while. At least I hope so, because I don't know what else I can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to move to uh, a couple more questions before we open it up to Q&A for everyone uh, about politics. You don't cover politics really now, but you've covered a lot of politics. Yeah. So I have one question about the current campaign, one historical question. You know, what are your thoughts about this current election on both sides of the aisle? I mean. How's it, how's it similar to the elections that you've covered? How's it different from the elections you've covered? You know, I, I think the, I, I, you know, you sort of look at who's doing well on the Republican side. I mean, it's a, it's a real indictment of the way our politics has been. I mean, I mean, whether you agree or not with Mr. Trump, he's clearly unvarnished and unfiltered. And that clearly makes, is working. You know, we live in an age in which every single word uttered by politicians on both sides of the aisle, liberal and conservative, every word, every phrase, every speech, every message has been sanded down and focus grouped and, and parsed very carefully. And so, and again, you're not dumb. You know that. You can always tell. Um, and I, I, you know, I think a lot of Trump's appeal, our people, and, and also Carly Fiorina's appeal and Ben Carson's appeal is, the, is, is, is the, the desire to get somebody from outside of sort of what's traditionally um, uh, the places where candidates have traditionally been found, either in Congress or in the, in the state houses around the country. You know, I will say, I mean, only, you know, only in politics does having no experience count for you, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you get on the plane and the pilot's like, hey, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not married to that old FAA way of flying, you know? I got some fresh new ideas about how we're gonna get to California, you know? And hey, I'm gonna make some mistakes, but I promise you, right, let's all go together. You're like, no, no, I want Captain Sullenberger, you know? Uh, you know, you get on the you get on the operating table. The doctor's like, "Hey, you know what? Before you go under, I got to tell you, I've never done this before." <laughs> you know, but but here we go, right? Well, you know, um, uh, but that calculus has sort of like not uh, not made any difference this year, and I think it's partly because people are so sick of of this 
feeling that no one is ever really being completely honest with them. Uh, and it's one reason why, you know, turnout goes down all the time. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, I mean, you know, we've, 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 we've lived in this universe for the last 20 years where the only thing that moved voters was saying really mean things about the opponent and saying them again and again and again and again. And in many cases, they were true. But that's the part of politics that really worked and moved people because, you know, when you say, I'm going to have lower taxes and a stronger defense and we're all going to fix the public schools and, and, you know, pave your roads and life's going to be better for everybody, and then time goes by and, like, none of those things happen. Like, it's the same thing as us saying, you know, we have, a, we have this incredible, shocking story that's going to change your life, and it turns out it isn't that shocking and it didn't change your life, and your taxes didn't go down, and there's still a pothole outside your house. Okay. My last question, then we'll open it up to your questions. Um, you uh, did cover the 96 campaign, and I'm sure you covered Senator Dole at other times. What are your thoughts on Bob Dole? And well, I, I mean, I, I was, uh, I, I, I did cover the 96 campaign, but I wasn't on the road in the 96 campaign. Um, I spent some time with him in 88, and I also covered Washington for a few years, um, uh, when independent of campaigns. I covered the House and the Senate back in the um, late 70s and early 80s. And, you know, I mean, uh, it's very hard for me to believe that you guys don't already know this. I mean, Bob Dole's the kind of politician that isn't around anymore. Um, uh, the kind of person who, you know, is, you know, uh, uh, first of all, like, like exactly what we're talking about here. I mean, I never had the feeling that, and I didn't agree with everything Bob Dole said, but I never had the feeling, like, you know, this is some like focus group answer written by his handlers that he has memorized and now he's saying it. And you know, you listen to these debates on, on both sides and you just think like, oh yeah, you spent like an hour rehearsing that line and you said it again and again and again. And one of the great things about Dole was you never felt that way with him. I mean, he was always like a straight shooter. And if he didn't agree with you, then he didn't agree with you. And if you didn't agree with him, well, you know, at least maybe you appreciated that he was being honest. And I, I wish there were more. I, I wish there were more Bob Dole's. I do. Um, I think we'd all be better off. Okay, going to go to the audience. We have the first question right here. Hold up your hand if you want to ask a question and get the <laughs> attention of one of these two young men in suits. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I think we have a pretty good idea of of what you do and um, how you do it. But when it comes to the type of reporting that you really, really love, like the type of work you really want to engage in, what, why, why do you love it? Well, you know, reporters, first of all, if you're a reporter, it's fun knowing stuff before anybody else. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's fun knowing secrets, other people's secrets. Even if you don't tell them, it's fun. Um, it's fun exposing things that people want to keep hidden. And I'm talking about, I mean, this has been true whether you're covering a murder or politics or, you know, the school board. I mean, there's always, I mean, everybody's got some agenda. And, and sort of finding out what that is and understanding it and explaining it to people so that they can make, you know, their informed choices, make their, inform their choices a little better. I mean, I, I, you know. I mean, whatever way you want to vote or, or donate your money or spend your time or which school board member you want to, you know, latch your wagon to, that's up to you. But, you know, you should know that they're taking money from the pencil company and maybe that's why they keep ordering that kind of pencil, you know. <laughs> okay, we're going to go back here. Yes. Thank you very much for the conversation. I wanted to ask you about your, um, un your knowledge or your awareness of what many of us uh, Americans believe is the juncture of the uh, evisceration of our republic and its constitution and our inherent rights, which is the conjunction of political covert murder with the um, controlling of the media by uh, covert uh, operators in the intelligence community. Okay. So a few data points for you to riff on might be Something like uh, Carl Bernstein's article, The CIA and the Media, and Jeffrey Epstein, or uh, Bill Tepper, Dr. Bill Tepper, who is the former CIA director. Okay, 
Let him answer the question for you. Okay. Uh, you. First of all, nobody's uh, uh, nobody's controlling me, um, um, and I'm unaware of any other journalists being controlled by the by the uh, government or by anybody else. Now, you know, have there been uh, in the past, uh, uh, you know, uh, misinformation and disinformation campaigns by the government over the years? Yeah, we've all we've all read about them. Uh, I don't think there are any covert murders being being uh, uh, done by the government, but uh, maybe I'm not skeptical enough. But but I will tell you if there are, but I will tell you if there are, if there are, there are more journalists out there now looking for that kind of thing than there ever have been. So I mean, there's never been a time in American history where a conspiracy to cover up um, um, improper or illegal acts by the government has less of a chance of succeeding than it does now. That's what I think. Okay, we have a question right here. If you saw the Republican con uh, debates a few weeks ago, the first one, would you comment on the direction the interviewers took in trying to pit one candidate against another just to get a confrontation going for the uh, entertainment factor? Well, I mean, you know, you say for the entertainment factor, I, you know, I don't, I don't, um, um, you know, I thought, in the first debate, I thought they challenged Trump a lot. But on the other hand, if you're the front runner, you can expect to get more challenges than, than other people. Um, what I wished in that early first debate was that everybody else had been, had been subjected to the same sort of aggressive questioning that Trump was, uh, that he later complained about. Um, but I, you know, is it for the entertainment value? I mean, look, the, you're getting you're getting 20 million plus people watching that debate and then later the, the CNN debate. Um, uh, I don't know that's the entertainment value as much as it is, there's a lot of interest in this campaign from, from both sides. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I don't, uh, um, I, would, I would have liked to have seen everybody questioned sort of as, as aggressively as some of the candidates were. And I also thought, the, the other, the, the, my big complaint about the first debate was the separation of the candidates into two tiers. I mean, when it, 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 polls don't mean anything at that point. We're more than a year away, and this was, I'm talking about the first debate, and like, there's 17 candidates, put them all on stage. Let everybody argue it out. Um, I, I would have, I, I think creating sort of the children's table is, <laughs> is I think really terrible for some, to some candidates. It makes it, and that's a, you know, that's not something the voters did, that's something the, the, the media does, you know? So, you know, and CNN did it, and then Fox did it, and I presume now, you know, whoever does the next debate, they're gonna do it too, if there's still that many candidates, and that, you know, there's no, I mean, there's not, to me, there's not a big difference between somebody who's polling at like 5% and somebody who's polling at like 3%. I mean, they're both kind of nowhere, so, Put them all, put them all up there, and that's how you get from three percent to twenty percent. Okay, back here. Um, do you know uh, the rationale that people use in uh, deciding which political candidates get coverage? Like I've noticed, uh, uh, one case in particular is that uh, there has been more media attention paid to uh, to uh, Martin O'Malley as opposed to uh, Senator Bernie Sanders even though uh, Sanders has higher poll numbers than O'Malley. Uh, I have not. Both are kind of I have largely not, ignored. I have not noticed that at all. It seems to me like Sanders is getting more, getting more attention. Uh, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen anything about O'Malley. Um, um, I, I literally, I mean, but, I, but again, like I'm, let me, and let me be, let me, let me restate something that we already know here. I mean, I'm not involved in making any of these decisions, and I don't even cover politics anymore. Those, those days are, are unfortunately behind me, and I kind of miss them. Although, the extent to which you, I mean, when I was covering politics, and when I was covering campaigns, if you wanted to, you know, struggle through the crowd to say to Bob Dole, hey, you're five points behind in California, Senator, what are you gonna do? And then he would give like a, you know, one sentence answer, and you could use that in your evening news piece. Now you can't do that. There's no more access to the candidates. The, 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 uh, 
the technique that was sort of pioneered by the Reagan people when they got in the White House has now been adopted by everybody, which is you control the message and how the candidate or the president is seen and reporters don't get to break through that bubble and ask a question which they're later gonna use in their story. You have a press conference and you get to answer the questions or not answer the questions, but you're not gonna get surprised by anybody and everybody's evening news story is gonna look pretty much the same. And that, again, that knows no ideology. That is the way politics is today. And I'm guessing, although I'm not doing it anymore, that covering politics from that point of view uh, with those rules in place um, is pretty tough. And, and probably not that rewarding, or not as rewarding as it used to be. Okay, I have a question right here. Thank you for coming. Um, I turned on CNN this morning and uh, watched the Pope's airplane on the tarmac and runway in Havana for I don't know how long. Pretty exciting. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it was just, <laughs> and then we had the situation of the Russians evidently moving significant amounts of uh, material and, and personnel into Syria and Netanyahu going to Russia, but where was that coverage? But we're covering the Pope's plane. Yeah, but I, you know, it's, it just, I, I was ready to throw the television out the window. But you never do that. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it, it's too heavy. I, okay. It's too old and okay. too heavy, um, I couldn't do it, but um, I, I, that just got me to. Don't talk like to, that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's like hate speech. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, look, I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the essential truths of TV is the trivial always drives out the serious. That was my dad's line, but he, he was right about that. Um, you know, the fire at night is always going to get covered uh, more than the discussions about your water rates, even though one of those things affects you and the other one doesn't at all. Okay, we got a question back here. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I'm interested in hearing what your comments are in reference to the trend of the current legalization of marijuana and if you have any ideas on long-term effects. Um, uh, I'm probably the worst person to ask about that because I've never tried it. Um, I grew up with, uh, with uh, significant respiratory illnesses and both my parents smoked like chimneys, cigarettes, tobacco. And, uh, uh, and so smoke was always my enemy um, when I was growing up. I remember waving smoke away from like cornflakes in, in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, and I remember saying to my parents, they were like, driving or driving me to school, they're like, can we open the window? Like, no, it's cold. They're like, oh, you know. Um, so when I, was, when I was in college and marijuana was, was sort of you know, tacitly legal because police were not going to come on campus back then. Like, I had no interest in like ever having anything to do with any smoke. So I never tried it. What's good? And I, I I voted against. I tell you this. I voted against the uh, the ballot initiative in California that legalized it because, uh, you know, I, I'm. Uh, um, um, I don't think it's nearly. It's clearly not nearly as bad for you as alcohol or cigarettes, but. If you ask me, I'd probably make those illegal too, since I don't use either one of them. But, but I, we have a lot of problems in the country. More stoned people does not seem to be the answer. <laughs> but, but I will say, but there's no. But I'm a believer in democracy, and there isn't any question that a significant part of the country wants it, and people want to have access to it. And the long-term effects, I, I don't know anything about them. Um, uh, but uh, it certainly doesn't seem, at least at this point, to be as, uh, as bad for you as, uh, as cigarettes. Okay, got a question over here. Hi. Um, welcome to the University of Kansas. Thank you. And um, being at the University of Kansas, we've talked tonight about a couple of things, about how journalism has evolved because of technology and politics has evolved. Uh, evolved. And we have a couple of faculty here and um, people who teach journalism and political science classes. So if you were invited to one of our classes, what are a couple of things that you would want to see or what you would emphasize in your lecture? Hmm. Well. Good question. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, an idea now, true or false, can take hold in this country much more quickly than it ever could 
because of social media. I mean, look how quickly everybody had an opinion about the dentist who killed the lion. That, was, that happened in less than 24 hours. People who had no opinion about big game hunting were suddenly furious and talking about it and talking to their friends about it. Now that's all social media. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, and, and there's a, there's, there are huge implications in that for, for, uh, for politics as well. I mean, there's a, you know, once something catches fire like that, it doesn't matter whether it's true or false, whether it's fair or unfair. It's, it's going out there. And changing minds back once people have sort of swallowed that story. You know, this guy's a terrible guy. He broke the law. He went there. He wanted to kill. He killed this lion. Everybody loved the lion. Now the lion's dead. It's his fault. I mean, that's, that all happened in like less time than it just took me to say it. Uh, that's true with all kinds of political stories too. I mean, look. I mean, look how look how quick the uh, 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 the Trump talking about the Mexicans, uh, his initial comments about Mexican Americans and how that or uh, Mexican immigrants and how that how quickly that happened. I mean, I mean, there's no there's no stopping stuff once it gets on social media. Okay, we have a question in the back. You said you never sell, saw yourself going into crime. If you could go back and report on anything else, what would that be with the experience you have now? Oh, well, I do miss politics, but it's changed a lot. And I'd have to live in Washington. <laughs> and I don't want to live in Washington anymore. I lived there a long time. Um, I mean, look, this is the thing I always wanted to do. And, uh, and if, if uh, if, as our bosses are discussing, um, um, uh, we end up doing some different kinds of stuff on um, on Dateline on Sundays, uh, that might uh, that might be just what we need. Uh, because I, it, it's I, I'm not I'm not tired of covering crime. I love these stories. They're 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 to the people that are involved in them, to the families of the victims who who frequently feel you know, ignored by the rest of the world while they're going through the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Um, these stories are incredibly important. And for some of these people, it's like the only time their story will ever get told. So there's a big responsibility in sort of, you know, speaking to the dead and on behalf of their families. So, you know, I didn't see myself going into crime, but I've learned a lot covering this, I have. Okay, we have a question right here. We uh, seem to have entered an era when we have partisan journalism as well as partisan politics. And so you have one uh, network reporting that the sky is red, the other that the sky is blue, and all too frequently the- And the, the, other, and the other wondering where that plane was in the sky, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, yeah. frequently the establishment yeah. media reports it as purple. And, and, and what is the responsibility of mainstream journalism to actually get to the truth rather than reporting the controversy? Well, first of all, the controversy, reporting the controversy is sometimes how you find the truth. But, you know, I, I, I love, I always love the idea of the classification of the mainstream media. I mean, that's like me and the New York Times and the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, and your local paper here, and a TV station in Denver. Uh, I, don't have any, I don't have anything in common with those other outlets. Um, sometimes we all end up covering the same thing, and sometimes we all end up covering the same thing in the same way. I mean, journalists have some, I mean, journalists are generally skeptical, um, uh, generally less likely to buy the official story, but, you know, otherwise we're kind of as different as, as anybody else. I, I've never sort of bought the idea that there's this like mainstream media and like we all have this meeting every morning and we decide what we're gonna cover and sort of what slant we're gonna give it. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I've, never, uh, I, I've never bought into that. Um, and, you know, until, uh, 
So if Fox came along, there was no, you know, nobody had a, had a stated mission uh, until they came along. And Fox News, I mean, is a, I mean, uh, Fox News is brilliant marketing. I mean, they, they figured out who their audience was and what they wanted to hear, and they're giving it to them. And they're good at it. And it's really well-produced television, too. Roger really knows what he's doing. Uh, so, but that's, a, it's, that's an outgrowth of what I was talking about earlier, about how there are people who see themselves as programmers. Now, he's a programmer with a, you know ideological mission, but, but you, know, you identify your audience, and you find them, and you talk to them. They, they, they do that pretty well. MSNBC tried to do the same thing on the other side with, with clearly less success. Um, uh, and I think maybe they're gonna, I think there's gonna be some changes at MSNBC. I sort of detect that that's going on. Um, how, I don't know. Again, I don't, I, don't, I don't work in that part of NBC. But just based on sort of what I've read that they're doing. Um, but I, you know, I've always, I've always, I've always sort of thought the uh, the idea of a mainstream media in which we're all sort of one big pack um, is not really is just not really accurate. I never really bought out of that. Now that said, you know, you know, you know, you know people go, when are you going to start reporting the truth, or when are we going to get at the truth, or you know, why are you biased, or you know, why I see so much, you know, I mean, I mean, everybody thinks that we're Everybody thinks that we're biased when they hear things they don't like hearing. You know, that's always, I mean, whatever it is, whichever <laughs> side you're on. I mean, either we're making too much out of the Hillary email story, or we're not making enough out of it. But nobody says, yeah, you got that about right. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah, that's about right. You spend about the right amount of time on that. Yeah. Also, this is like, this and police officers, this is like one of the few jobs that everybody thinks they know better than the people doing it. You know, again, you don't walk into the cockpit and say, like, well, what are you doing? No, no, clearly, we, you need to increase the airspeed. You're an idiot. How do you, like, why are you flying so slowly? And why is the automatic pilot not on? You know? So they say, get out of here. Let us fly the plane. We know what we're doing. You know, but everybody thinks they know, they understand policing better than the police. And everybody thinks they understand journalism better than journalists. Okay, we'll go back to the back. <coughs> When reporting on crime, which tends to come across as just entertainment, are there like any sort of overall messages or themes that you try to get across? Does it change with, with each story? Um, could you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, certain things are, you know, I mean, w you know, I mean, one of the things that, that sort of, you know, has emerged from all these, all these murders we've covered. I mean, you know, it, it's astonishing to me. How many people really think they can get away with murder? Because it's a lot harder than people think it is. I mean, lying is harder than people think it is. Committing, I mean, I mean the, we've covered a lot of people who think, like, I'm going to commit this crime. I'm going to kill, you know, the mother or father of my children because I have about had it with them and I want the insurance money or whatever, or I want to go live with this other person that I met. Um, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get away with it. And the police won't ask me about it, but I'll say I didn't do it, and then that'll be the end of it. Uh, and I won't think about it, and I won't dream about it, and it won't change who I am, and it won't, it won't make me crazy, and my kids won't suspect anything, and I won't feel the urge to blurt it out to somebody else five years down the road. Um, and the police will just kind of give up when I say I didn't do it. Well, that isn't the way it works, but there are a lot of people who really think that is the way it works. And all I have to do is commit a crime, which I've never done before, and not get caught, and not leave any of my DNA behind, and not get any of the person's blood on me, and then just deny it and deny it, and then I'll be free, and I'll enjoy this money, and I'll never think about it again. And it's astonishing to me that people do think that way, but they do. I mean, lying is hard. Police, smarter than they are on television. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty good at spotting liars. Um, pretty good at spotting people who are pretending to cry. Um, uh, and they know a lot about you. Uh, they know a lot about you from, you know, from your cell phone and where you've been and who you've talked to and what, you've, what your body language was like on that security camera at McDonald's. Uh, and it's all, uh, j just get a divorce, folks. <laughs> just, just. 
just get divorced. It's, it's, it's not the most desirable outcome, but man, it beats prison. Uh, I'd like to revisit one of your uh, former subjects, and that was on uh, the politicians' uh, role in, in controlling what questions are asked. And my, I guess my question to you and, and the comments I would like to hear is, why has the media allowed that to happen, and what can they do to change it? Um, we haven't had enough. We, we haven't... Uh, we haven't um Again, we, not really me, but, but as, a, as a class, we, um, we should have protested that more. Um, you know, if, uh, if everybody, like, stopped covering candidates who don't have press conferences or don't have regular press availabilities, like, they'd start having them. They'd start having them right away, because... If they aren't on TV or in the newspaper or on the internet somewhere, they would really notice it and they would really hate it and they would change the way they did it. Uh, but we all, uh, I, we're, we're, we're too, we've been too agreeable to that. Um, reporters everywhere, They're, they operate under those, under those strictures even though they probably shouldn't have. And, you know, it's... Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it used to only be true at the White House, and now it's true, like, like everywhere. I mean, the great thing about campaigns used to be, I mean, I remember in 92, 92, I was, I was in California, and I did an interview with Bill Clinton while he was, like, walking from one event to the other. And, like, I don't think he really wanted to do it, but he had to get from here to there, and, I, and they, they didn't keep me away from him, and my cameraman was right in his face. And so I asked him, like, five or six questions, all of which ran that night. Um, now that wouldn't happen. I mean, you wouldn't be able to get anywhere near him. Uh, and I'm talking about if he were still a candidate, not just a, not a president. Um, and that's bad. That's bad for everybody, um, except maybe the, the campaign, because they're all about control now. OK, well, we have time for two more questions. We're going to go to the back of the room and then to the center. Can you uh, compare or describe the difference between interviewing a presidential candidate and interviewing a convicted murderer? No. <laughs> there's, um, uh, uh, there's not a lot of difference. Um, the difference is the verdict in on one of them um, and not on the other. Um, you know, they're both trying to put their best face forward. They're both trying to convince me that despite what I've heard, they're actually <laughs> terrific people uh, who are misunderstood, right? And who need the benefit of the doubt, right? So actually, there's like not a whole lot of, not, and I mean, most people that you interview, you know, I, one of the questions I get asked a lot, which I, I'm glad I didn't get asked that here, is uh, uh, people ask, you know, are, are you scared? You're interviewing these murderers. I'm like, yeah, not by the time they get to me. By the time they get to me, they're like presidential candidates. They're, you know, they're trying very hard to persuade, no, no, I'm a terrific guy, you don't understand, you know, and you're all right, yeah, maybe some of that, you know, the, the, the bloody money was found under my mattress, I didn't know it was there, and, you know, others put it there, and, you know, yeah, I wouldn't lie to you about that. Um, what possible reason would I have to lie to you about that? So, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 it also, there's like, you know, guards all over the room when we're doing it. Um, uh, we're interviewing a guy in, uh, in California, in the lockup, and he'd already been, he'd been arrested, um, he'd been arrested, he'd been convicted, but he had not yet been sent to a, uh, a prison. Uh, and once, once, uh, once you go to prison in California, you can't give any more TV interviews, which is a law that somebody changed, or somebody put in because Charles Manson was appearing on TV too much. The bad news is, of course, now you can't interview anybody in California um, who's in prison, but this guy wasn't in prison yet, and he was, uh, he wanted to talk about why he was not guilty of the murder that he had just been convicted of, which we were doing a story about on Dateline. And he was, uh, uh, they, they bring him in, they sit him down, they take his chains off, you know, and we start doing the interview. And I think he thought that I was going to just like, you know, at the end of the interview, kind of like give him the key to the city and say, well, you know, you know <laughs> you're, a, you're an innocent man unjustly accused. But I'm like, he clearly did this. So... Uh, <laughs> I mean, the evidence against it was pretty, pretty daunting. And he got, he got more and more irritated with me. Um, 
uh, as the interview went on. And finally, like a presidential candidate or a candidate for some public office, he said, I'm, uh, I'm done with this interview. And he stood up. And the guards are like, sit down. <laughs> 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 what do you think you are? He's like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, and he said, oh, yeah. And we finished the interview. But, you know, uh, so the answer is that sometimes there's not a whole lot of difference. No. Okay, we have one time for one final question right here. I'm a proud graduate of what used to be known as the William Allen White School of Journalism and Public Information. So that tells you how long ago right. I graduated. Um, I guess my question is it seems to me we're now in the era of the celebrity journalist. And uh, for aspiring journalists and uh, journalists, uh, 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 what, do you th what would you say is the object lesson we should take from the Brian Williams experience at NBC? Well, you know, look, um, um, Brian's a very good friend of mine. I was at his daughter's wedding this past weekend. She's also my goddaughter. Um, I've known him a long time. And, uh, you know, I think he, you know, paid a significant price for for his mistake, and um, uh, and I'm glad it's over, and I'm glad he's back. Um, as for celebrity journalism, um, you know, I, I don't. I'm not a big fan of. I mean, when you're talking about you're talking about the journalist him, himself or herself being the celebrity, as opposed to journalism about celebrity. You mean? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's always a mistake when you're bigger than the story. I mean, when the fact that you're showing up to cover the story is in itself a story, then something's gone wrong here because, you know, it's always better when you're the, when you're just the observer. To me, it's better when you're just the observer and the stuff happens, not because, you know, people are, are coming out of their homes to say, oh my God, look, look who it is, which by the way, doesn't happen very much around me. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't think that really would apply to me. But. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I mean, journalists shouldn't be bigger than the stories they cover. That's definitely true. You know, and that's true with everybody. Okay. Josh, thanks for a fabulous evening. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Hope to see you at our next program in a couple weeks. Thank you all for your support. Thanks, everybody. Is that good? Okay.